As David mentioned at the outset, this is kind of a, a big deal uh, to put on this event when your home is in the San Francisco Bay Area. And this does not happen with David's partnership, with Barry Swale's partnership, David Bev. Uh, I can go on down the line, my colleague, uh, Dirk Peterson, um, Chris Broderick, Liz Hammond, uh, Cameron Ellis, I mean, I can go Daphna Aronson, on and on and on, all the people who are involved in making today happen. Because I'm often asked, Al, why do you do this? It's not easy to build a community and bring people together. And I have a very simple answer, is that if I don't do it, somebody else will. And they might not do it for virtuous purposes. I am here to amplify this notion of people data for good. What does that mean? First and foremost, I'm a parent. Our son is 18 years old. Uh, he was just accepted into university uh, in, uh, in the States. Uh, we are ecstatic as, as parents. We're also the parents of a almost 16 year old girl. And they are deciding on what they're gonna study. And as we're having these discussions about what they're gonna study, we're talking about the future. You know, what jobs might they get? How are employers now looking at them, both their digital fingerprint, footprint, whatever you wanna say, and also how are they consciously creating that print. So what is embedded in all that? Data. Okay, what data are they going to generate so they can put their authentic selves out there and be matched with an employer who's going to give them opportunity and celebrate them for who they are? So this is what I'm going to put forth. Yes, I've been in this field for quite a number of years, but I do not come to you from a knowing place. I come to you as a learner from a curious place. So I invite all of you to take that mindset over the, our two days together. And what I'll say as well is that as your co-chair and host, I request a couple things, but this one uh, above all else, is that we be kind to one another, that we shrink the inner critic and elevate the compassionate witness. We're not here grading whether or not a vendor or a speaker you know, has done this right or, or wrong. What we're doing is looking for what's right and celebrating what is and exploring what's possible. Because my contention, having my perspective in this field, is that we're at about a two. In 2040 and 2050, we're gonna be at an eight, nine, or 10 in terms of what we can do with people-related data. And again, I wanna emphasize, I believe we're at a two. Why? because most of the analytics that we're doing is based on what I would call the frequentist approach. We're taking data sets and we are analyzing them with the assumption that what? It's gonna predict the future. That is based on what premise? That the past is gonna be an accurate representation of the future. Is that always true? No, no it's not. You know, so what is it about? Are we gonna gather people's intentions we don't do that very well right now. Are we gonna grab their soft skills and package that in data? We don't do that very well right now. Will we be able to do that in the future? My belief is yes, but we have to plan accordingly. So what I'm gonna share with you quickly before I uh, introduce Isabel um, from FIS, who's fantastic, who's gonna be able to set the stage for our two days from a strategy perspective and how the employees are going to be looked at in a more authentic, real way, when I certainly celebrate her work and what she's done. With that in mind, we have to understand where we sit, given our profession, given who we're trying to affect change in. So I'm gonna go through this real quick. And this is ambitious. The future of work, in my view, is not only gonna be done by humans, and this is true today, right? It's done by machines, it's done by outsource providers, it's done by contractors, consultants. A variety of people and things do work on behalf of an organization to get things done. In people analytics or workforce analytics, what are we focused on primarily? The upper right here, where we have a high competitive advantage, long-term time horizon, long-term cost. But what happened in 2008, 2009, particularly in North America, a lot of the organizations shrank. Yet the work did not diminish. In fact, the economy turned around and organizations started to grow financially. Did they hire commensurate from 
where they were? No, they did not. So they used more contingent labor, outsourced providers, and now increasingly automation and machine learning and things to offload work off of people. Now, I would contend AI in most cases is more closely associated with what I would call augmented intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence. And it begs the question, is that a worthwhile distinction? I would say it is. So most of the vendors here, and I celebrate each and every one of them, is that they're probably augmenting a process and augmenting someone's capability. Are they going off and figuring something out and doing something independently? Not really. So I, again, I encourage you, not necessarily to be critical, but what I often cite, and I don't cite it here, but I'll cite it verbally, is I cite a Chinese proverb. The beginning of wisdom is calling things by their right names. The beginning of wisdom is calling things by their right names. So with people analytics and the underlying technologies and data, are we calling things by their right names? So who are we? We're suppliers of information and insight, and we often work through partners, don't we? HR business partners, and we're ultimately affecting an internal customer, a business leader or a line leader, what have you. Sometimes we go with that individual, sometimes we go straight to that uh, end customer, and sometimes we play phone like we did in fourth grade where you tell something to somebody, you tell something to somebody, and then it goes up, and then it comes back down. Is it the same thing that you said at the outset? Oftentimes it's not. So we have to be aware of where we're sit. Ultimately, we want to create confidence-inspiring narratives or stories that help people make better decisions. We have to get away from this notion of certainty. We're trying to get better. We're ultimately, again, I would say we're trying to instill confidence. What is confidence? Well, it's this feeling of trust that I'm going to move forward in ways that's based on, in our case, insight that's generated through data. Okay, where do we sit? Let's be conscious of that. Usually this is a build, but I'm going to accelerate. Historically, in our profession, we have been content being customers of the data within our system. We've thus tried to make magic out of data that oftentimes was ill-suited to answer the questions leaders wanted or needed to know. So what is our challenge now? Our challenge is to get in front of the process here and help design the experiences, select the systems, and generate the data that are appropriate to answer the questions that leaders want or need to know. What does that imply? That implies that we know what stories to tell. And that's where I really encourage you and your organizations is to uproot from this idea that we have a dashboard, we're gonna put a coherent narrative around it. We have to have the conversation first and then identify what data and analytical techniques and what tools are appropriate. So design, data, analytics, and change. A data strategy, in my view, precedes an analytic strategy. Does that resonate with anybody here? Yeah? All right. And again, I'm going to accelerate here because I want to give uh, Isabel ample time. But it's what I'm doing, and I'm not going to share a lot of data. What I am going to do is provide some mental models for you to take over these two days. So when you're talking with vendors, when you're thinking about your own system in your organization, that you have what I would call a very authentic, real perspective. Because I often hear, well, this people analytics thing is, is just starting, just cat, I mean, people analytics has been going on for a heck of a long time, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So here we have this, call it worker experience. This is constantly a dilemma. Is it candidate experience, is it employee experience? Is it, I'm gonna call it worker for a second. So we have applicants that either get new hired, they become tenured, they might be a high potential, they get promoted, um, they might ind be independent contributors. Under this experience are a host of technologies, and within these technologies are data. Why were these technologies implemented? Very basic question. By the way, I encourage you to think about asking the basic questions when we're doing this work. Try people, oh, I gotta ask a smart question, you'll know, be the insightful person. I mean, ask the basic questions. Why were these systems implemented in the first place? I'll give you the answer. To either create 
or improve a process, a performance management process, a recruiting process, a learning process. It was done for, was it, was the intention to generate insight into people's behavior and in turn take action? Oftentimes, no. Most of the time, no. So we're taking data out of these processes and trying to apply them to questions that they may or may not be suited to answer. This is not a criticism, it's just being very aware of what we're dealing with, okay? So this, these are HR technologies that are inside our organization. Increasingly now, what do we have? We have collaboration tools, emails, calendar, you know, ONA, um, my analytics from Microsoft, um, we have LinkedIn, Glassdoor, educational data. Um, in the US, we have data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. All of this is people data. So in other words, we're not only looking at the data within our organization, we're looking at data outside our organization as well. And we're synthesizing that into these coherent narratives. The idea that we're gonna put everything into a relational database or a cube or something else is gonna pop an answer. I would like and encourage you to uproot that thinking. We're gonna have pieces of insight and we're gonna to have to put them together to develop these confidence-inspiring narratives that's gonna turn, drive change in our organizations. And it begs the question, what change are we gonna go after? And again, having the conversation first. So employee experience, human-centered design, uh, that track is gonna be a key theme. If we have a human-centered design, we're gonna have talent processes that are gonna support that design, that experience. We're gonna have te technologies that are gonna support that process, and we're gonna have that desired experience actually come to life, and we're gonna be able to measure and monitor. So, I don't, and we're gonna have our culture ultimately. That's gonna be the stories that people tell about their experience in that organization. In my definition and the definition of many IO psychologists, that is what a culture is. We can hope it's some values that are on the wall, but it's really the stories that people within that organization tell about their work life. I don't know if many of you have had this similar experience, but when I first started in this work, we would have an HR strategy in a matrix and some initiatives associated with their responsible persons and on the far right would be Actually, in your case, on the far right, there would be, okay, how are we gonna measure it? And it's like, you know, I, no, that's not how I had, I had headcount, turnover, and engagement. That was pretty much all the measures I had at the time. Now, data is pervasive. It is something that has to lead the conversation. So the idea that, hey, we're gonna have a data strategy or sometimes a measurement approach after a HR strategy is formulated, I would encourage you again to uproot that thinking and recognize that data is embedded in all the processes that we do. I don't have to, you know, that's not earth shattering. What I do believe is earth shattering is approaching it consciously to say, okay, given that we have pervasive data that we cannot just look at this micro set of data that we have to look at the data that represents the experience, not only that we are delivering today, but the experience that we want to deliver tomorrow. Because nine out of 10 times that data is going to be present. One other thing I'll say before I leave this notion, and I alluded to it before, is the data appropriate? Data can and should be in many times created and many of the vendors here are now creating data as well as packaging and analyzing it. So being open mind to new measures. I wrote an article years ago called Performance Management is Stupid. Didn't make a lot of friends. <laughs> but what I do believe is that language matters. There was a study done in the US in 2004 by the Corporate Executive Board that effectively showed that not only does performance appraisal processes disengage the person being reviewed, it disengages the person doing the reviewing. There's also this notion, as many of you heard, of idiosyncratic rater effect, where ratings speak more to the rater than those being rated, yet we're using that data all the time. Is it appropriate? You know, again, we are in a crisis, in my view, of creativity in our discipline. We need to do better. We need a clear idea of where we're going. 
and we got to get there. So a few more slides, and then I'm going to kick it over to Isabel. I wrote this article, I don't know, 18 months ago or, or so, People Linux 3.0, and it begged the question right out of the gate, what the heck was 1.0 and 2.0? <laughs> so as I alluded to earlier, People Analytics has been going on for a long time. I would argue 100 years in an org, psych, and related uh, disciplines. We've been looking at human behavior in organizations. Okay, we've been doing it on what, what I would call an event-driven basis. In other words, we have a problem or certain dynamics, and we go in and study it as researchers. What we can do now is we can now automate a lot of that research work, a lot of the statistics. And we also can aggregate the data better. So what happened about 20 years ago in the, in the wake of the BI revolution, which really started in the early 90s, is that BI technology mindset came into HR. And I had the great pleasure of being a customer of what was InfoHRM or Inform, which is a precursor to what is now Vizier, uh, One Model, Cruncher, and, and others. It is. The case where we're now, again, augmented intelligence, we're able to aggregate data, put it in a uh, data set, push out dashboards to an HR community, for example, and they would be able to access that data, make uh, decisions based on that data much faster and more effectively than going to one individual who needed to create a report or something like that. So that's more 2.0. 3.0 now is a lot of this is now automated by tools. And for us to do the work that we are now being asked to do with limited resources, we have to think about the ecosystem of work. So where I started about the future of work, that can also be applied to people analytic COEs. In other words, it's going to be technologies that are going to enable us to do people analytics and deliver value to our customers. It's not going to be just a technology so I can drive you know, do analytics on my own and my team of researchers do it, it's going to be, this is going to be effectively outsourcing some of the people analytics capability. And I use that word some intentionally. It's not going to be all. Because if you're going to do a study about talent markets, there are tools for that. If you want to better understand engagement and employee behavior in your organization, there are tools for that. There are tools for doing dashboarding and pushing out information to a community within your organization. So we have to understand the array of tools and then choose wisely. To think that we're going to do it all just by a bunch of heavy lifting internally uh, in our COEs or within our organization, I think, we again, we have to uproot that thinking. Make sense? You with me? Yeah? Good. So, I'm going to skip through this really quick. Just know that we need mental models about how data is going to be organized. So what I offer you here is a talent strategy framework. Many are like, what is a talent strategy? Well, for me, it's just very simple. You know, how are you attracting talent, compensating, communicating, delivering that experience that you want? One of the things that I heard at HR Tech last year, and it's becoming very commonplace, yet the action behind it is less speedy, is that we are in an era driven not only by data, but demands of the workforce and scarce talent, is that we need new management models. We have a literally a 100-year-old management model in most organizations that's driven by hierarchy. It's too slow. It's inefficient, yet we're still adopting that. It's echoing uh, research from Mercer, McKinsey, Deloitte. Uh, Josh Burson was saying that uh, at HR Tech uh, last year. So it is something that in HR we need to do better as well. We need governance around talent analytics, not only to prioritize projects and investments, but also manage the ethics. Because we don't have any, we have very few rather, uh, gateways to run through to make sure that we're doing the right things on behalf of employees. So where are we going? Many organizations like yours have IT strategies, uh, HR strategies, operational strategies. I wrote an article recently, HR's role in managing the amoeba. So the amoeba being all the array of ways we can do work now. And we have this critical, unique position to add value in helping organizations form what I would call a work strategy. How is work going to get done? And I don't mean to make a play on words. It's my firm belief that we understand talent markets. We understand the array of ways work can get done. Yet we are almost exclusively, I shouldn't say 
uh, almost exclusively, but uh, you get what I mean, insofar as we're looking at employees too much. We need to be looking at candidates, talent markets. We need to be looking at the broader system of how work gets done. Because if there's an AI initiative coming out of IT that is going to affect workload and we don't know it, that's not going to be good. That's going to affect the employee experience. That's going to affect capacity planning. That's going to affect a lot of things that if we get blindsided, that's not good. If we're, however, facilitating a operational body that's formulating work strategy, then we can get ahead of that and help guide the discussion. So as I start to wrap, I mentioned my kids earlier. After the basics, it's my belief that as human beings, we want three basic things. We want to be seen, we want to be heard, and we want to be empowered. You know, what's it like when you walk into a room and your wife or your husband looks at you? What is it like when you look at the dog? What happens when you look at a dog? Usually starts wagging its tail, doesn't it? Why is that? Because it's seen. Okay, what's it like to have somebody in front of you who's truly there for you, listening attentively with curiosity and compassion? You know, what's it like to be empowered as opposed to told what to do? So it's something, I, you know, there's going to be a lot of talk around feedback over the next couple of days, and I celebrate it. And it's not about not doing feedback. It's about defining what feedback is, in my view, more appropriately. Because we, particularly as knowledge workers, don't necessarily want to be told what to do. In matters of safety or you know, certain instances, possibly. But by and large, we want to be empowered. We want to be seen, heard, and offered ideas so we can choose what's most appropriate for us. Because if I'm a manager, I'm coming and telling you what to do, what does that presume? That presumes I have an omniscient point of view over what has happened to you to draw you to that outcome. That is arrogant and irresponsible in my view. What it would be like instead to come there with compassionate curiosity, hey, what went on for you? Hey, Al, you weren't speaking very loud. Well, I was choosing to speak low because I wanted to draw people in. Now, it might not have been effective, but if you say, hey, Al, speak louder, I'm like, no, that doesn't, that doesn't honor my art, my, my decision making. You know, so I would really encourage you over the next two days to think about how you're approaching one another, how you're looking at the vendors, how you're evaluating the speakers. You know, celebrate them, look to see them, hear them, and hopefully empower them. So as I wrap, people data for good is what we're about. It is not going to leave our mission as an organization. We have an opportunity and a responsibility to do right by people, not only employees or workers of these esoteric notions, but by human beings that have feelings and ideas and intentions and hopes that we, if, mis if we misuse data and draw some biases that we're unaware of, and we all have biases and we're going to continue to have biases, we're going to have value judgments, and that's okay. But we need to be thoughtful about how we approach it. So with that, thank you. Be the change you want to see in the world, and let's make some great things happen. So thank you very, very much. Appreciate it.